the way I use, you know, the kind of simulation for these types of uh, transitions is on the front end, right? You prepare what you envision the transition to look like for your stack up and give that to the layout person. They're going to implement that where it needs to be implemented, and then they kind of work around that. So you really use it as a constraint. Is that your thinking here as well? It is, but I'm modifying that constraint a bit. So the first off is, you know, constraint number one is what's the connector that you're using? And so I basically, we basically prepackaged that so that you basically load in the connector type you want. And a uh, functional breakout is actually generated. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Altium On Track podcast. I'm your host, Zach Peterson. Today, we'll be talking with Scott McMorrow, Strategic Technologist for Signal Integrity Products at Samtech. Scott is up for Engineer of the Year Award at DesignCon, and we're going to talk to him about his journey through the electronics industry and what he'll be doing at DesignCon this year. Scott, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me, Zach. Absolutely. I feel like you and I have probably conversed over SI lists at some point, and I see you post there. I'm sure you probably have seen me post there a time or two. So it's good to actually Absolutely. see each other face-to-face, -face, even if it's mediated by a camera. It is. It is. So um, just to get started, I always like to, to learn a little bit about people's journey into electronics. So maybe if you could just briefly tell us about your background and then how you got uh, started in electronics. Oh, you know, sure. Um, well, you know, as a kid, my father was an electronic uh, technician and electronics engineer for the Federal Age Aviation Agency and designed some pretty cool things, including instrument landing systems back in the 60s. And um, that got me interested in engineering um, and electronics. So I went to uh, Virginia Tech, my local uh, Virginia school. <clears throat> and got a degree in uh, electrical engineering in the, uh, well, I actually finally graduated in 1980. I took a few, I took a few years off and uh, went and repaired stereos for a couple of years, decided that repairing stereos isn't a good uh, career choice and that I really did want to be an engineer. So I went back, created my own curriculum uh, with electives, um, which was in the late seventies. Um, that was one of the first computer engineering and curriculums. And, uh, you know, from there, uh, graduated in 1980 and went on into my engineering career. Started out in aerospace in Denver at Martin Marietta, uh, 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 ground support electronics in, uh, in Littleton, Colorado. Um, and from there, jumped from job to job uh, back during the 80s and ended up on the West Coast in Oregon at uh, Lattice Semiconductor. Um, and from there, I was sort of around the uh, semiconductor industry and uh, found my way into problems that were, we didn't call it signal integrity back then, but they were inter interconnect problems. And... Uh, started solving them and understanding them. And uh, I've probably been formally a signal integrity engineer since about 1995 uh, or so. And uh, have been working in the industry as a signal integrity technologist ever since. You know, I think that people who are just getting into the industry and who uh, maybe dream of pursuing a career as, as an electronics engineer, they probably don't, don't really think about connectors or really components in general. Um, I think if they think about components, it's, you know, semiconductors, but um, I've never heard anybody say, I want to go be an SI guy at a connector company. Um, I think the SI people are very aware of, you know, how things like connectors can impact signal integrity. But, you know, I think broadly for PCB designers, they're just seen as another mechanical element. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, that was the way I looked at it um, years ago. And, um, you know, I spent most of my career since about 1997 as a consultant. Um, so I worked on platform problems for a variety of hundreds of different uh, customers, different kinds of platforms, digital electronics problems and RF electronics problems, crosstalk problems, video uh Pretty much anything that, uh, well, I could make a buck at, uh, you know, and, and get a job at. And um, 
in the process, I start. I formed my own company. I worked for an, a couple of consulting companies, and I formed my own around like about two thousand and two. And my uh, called Terra Speed Consulting, and my first customer was Samtech. And uh, like everybody at the time, uh, now Samtech, Samtech is fairly ubiquitous in the industry today. But at that time, if you said Samtech, uh, most people said who. Or, oh, yeah, they make those uh, 100 mil stick pins for uh, headers and things like, you know, for cable headers and things like that. Um, and I was asked to work with their, uh, they had just started a signal integrity department. And I was, I was asked to start working with them on developing what they called final inch which was they recognized that the connector goes on a board, but it doesn't matter how good the connector is. The final piece of it is that inch uh, in the breakout area of the board. Um, and, and that can either improve, uh, give you the best performance or it can limit performance seriously. So uh, we started creating application notes and test boards and, um, and, and I went on to consult for many, many other companies, but Samtech was always a customer year after year after year that was continuous as they, uh, as I grew my capabilities, their capabilities grew. And then finally, um, 10 years ago, uh, Samtech uh, gave me an offer I couldn't refuse and said, we would like you to bring your consulting business into Samtech and we'll buy it from you. Um, and so I started out and at the time, I think we maybe had 15 people in the signal integrity department at Samtech. We're now uh, over 90. Um, and we've grown exponentially. Uh, revenue and uh, has gone from a few hundred. You know, when I started working with Samtech, they were a 20 million, about 200 million dollar company. Um, and years ago, and today, uh, we're right around a billion dollars a year in sales. So it's been quite a journey. And uh, what we're now finding is. Uh, you know, the interconnect doesn't stop at the connector. It is in the board. It's in the vias. It's in the transitions. It's also in the cables. So I had the you know good fortune of working with our uh, cable plant in Wilsonville in designing the uh, high performance high speed twin X that we use. That's um, our next generation high speed air is going to be running uh, 224 gigabits per second in applications and in systems. So uh, we, we kind of look at all of those things and have encompassed that in what we do at Samtech. Yeah, Wilsonville, that's uh, right down the, the highway from me. So familiar area. Well, if you ever get a chance, you should ask for a, a, a tour of the plant. It's uh, They love to give tours and it's a fabulous facility. I, I just might have to do that. Um, so obviously, you know, a very long and illustrious career and um, I, I think it's really interesting that you got into doing this kind of consulting for Samtech right around the time that everybody else cites as the moment where they started to realize that you can't just lay out boards any which way you want to, because that's where you start to notice all the signal integrity problems due to fast logic. Would you would you say that's fair? Yeah, that's that's true. It's it, it, the oncom the uh, that it, it was this was coming up in the late 90s. Um, the signal integrity reflector was started back in um, the SI list, was started back in the late 90s by um, Larry Smith and uh, Ray Anderson from Sun Microsystems at the time. Um, and uh, that was where we all uh, shared our craft, learned from each other, hit a few secrets from people. But yes, uh, what I used to say is, if you don't have a signal and integrity problem today, you're going to have one in the future. And there, I would say until recent times, most companies did not even consider signal integrity to be a discipline or a problem in their systems until they had systems fail. And so pretty much uh, all of the companies that were the pioneers in signal integrity are ones that had systems, boards, chips fail, um, and it became um, out of necessity. And of course, we drag the rest of the industry with us. Um, and as we go faster and faster, everybody wants to go to the next standards, BCI Gen 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, a billion. And um, 
what was easy at the lower speeds becomes harder and harder and harder at the higher speeds. Um, and so it necessitates having some uh, knowledge of signal integrity these days. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely uh, mandatory uh, for pretty much any designer. Um, yeah. W- one th- so this, I think, gets into what you're going to be doing at DesignCon because you're going to be giving a tutorial at DesignCon. So if you could, just tell us about uh, the tutorial that you'll be giving. So the tutorial is about um, uh, the steps and the processes for advanced uh, printed circuit board connector or package or you know, BGA launch uh, design. And the idea is that I'm going to start out by teaching the basics, the physical basics of the, of the launch. Um, and I'm going to dispel a few myths along the way. And um, I'm going to break it down into what I call zones of control, those things that we have very good control over and those things that are similar uh, throughout the, the, the via barrel and the for differential or RF vias and, um, and how we can manipulate them and simplify the, there's a lot that it has to be controlled especially as we get to 112 and then 224 gigabits per second. This is not easy. So what I try to do is take a a problem that I would characterize as a -a whack-a-mole problem before. You would just beat it into submission until you finally killed all the moles. Um, But still a problem will pop up and I take it into, I take it into the realm of something that's more controllable, that's more understandable, that can inform you for all of your designs. And then I link this in with a a tool that's fairly uh, common in the industry in higher end uh, uh, signal integrity design. That's the ANSYS uh, HFSS 3D layout platform. And so uh, we then step into here is how you're going to do the optimizations. Um, and And the things that we can do to simplify that process but also I built a, uh, essentially a Python visualization package for uh, 3D layout that automatically builds and generates the, uh, the particular launch, uh, gives, it, gives it to you to the point where you have a, a whole bunch, a whole list of different parameters you can control, all named with uniform uh, naming conventions that are meaningful, all documented. And now you can start playing with, well, what if I do this? What if I, you know, how, how do I get my routing out? How do I stagger some of these launches in connectors and packages in order to facilitate routing, to facilitate lower crosstalk, uh, to facilitate uh, higher performance? Um, and so putting it all in one place, um, it's not a simple job, but I've simplified it to the point where um, a human being can actually um, play with things in literally in, in minutes. In minutes, we can build the launch, then start playing with the visual. How does it fit them? You know, how does it fit uh, with all of the different pins in the connector or in the package? And then at that point, um, you can start doing some simulations. Um, and um, if, if necessary, co-design with us or with others uh, where we help you in the process or um, you help yourselves or your colleagues. It makes it easy for, for example, to uh, the hardest thing to do in doing a, a printed circuit board launch design for a connector or a package is um, building it. Uh, in 3D, uh, so planar tools like Allegro and Altium and, and others um, really don't interface to the s- signal integrity world well. They just send the whole layout over there. Well, that's too much to simulate, and it's hard to break that down into simple elements. Um, on the other side, you have the people that use uh, ANSYS Age of Assess 3D tools because it is a three-dimensional problem or uh, CST Microwave Studio, or there are a few other tools in the industry. But it means you have to build up every piece individually. Well, ANSYS 3D Layout is the intermediary. It is a planar design tool that um, 
has a concept of pads and pad stacks and vias. And so I can have a via with different anti-pads on each layers. And it's all containerized, much like an EDA CAD system, but it simulates blazingly fast in the HFSS environment. So um, by writing a package, uh, software package around that to basically automatically generate these things, I can generate them in, uh, you, and will actually, the tool will be available for people. Um, you'll be able to generate them in the software in minutes, something that sometimes would take weeks to do because you had to craft it by yourself. And if you make a mistake, unraveling that mistake is very, very hard in these 3D design packages that are there with 3D electrical solvers. Yeah, you called it a whack-a-mole problem. Man, I totally relate to that one because it, it's, it, I've done, you know, many via designs, um, whether for, you know, RF or high speed digital on differential pairs or whatever. Um, but I always feel like, you know, you get it to where it's almost perfect and then you have to start playing with the parameters and it's like, yeah, you improve it in the area where you want, but then you create a new problem in some other frequency range. And it's really difficult to get it just right because it involves so much manual tuning and then each time you have to send it off to the to to the simulation package and you know like you said it either has to then be rebuilt manually or maybe you export it as a parasolid and then they can kind of recreate it from that um but it takes so much time you know it's really difficult and especially testing every single little variation oh exactly so the first thing i do is i try to simplify the variations um to make it more a physics-based approach we we treat vias as periodically loaded transmission lines, which is some people have talked about it in the past, but not in a, in a uniform kind of way. I basically look at the different layering and each one creates different parasitic loading, but eventually we reach an asymptotic impedance. Well, once we reach that, we know we're at about the right place. The hardest thing is finding the right operating point for the via diameter and the anti-pad sizes and the rest. Uh, once you get it in the right range, now it's fairly easy to look at what some of the parameters will do in some of the spacing. As an example, a lot of people start out with, with um, okay, I'm going to design a via. Well, I'm going to design a via transition for this thing. And I'm going to use um, nine mil drills, 0.225 millimeter drills. Great. Well, that might not be the optimum drill size for your design. So we very so I fairly fairly simply say, okay, let's make the via diameter programmable. Um, let's use standard values. Generally, I use 0 0.2, 0 0.225, and 0.25, corresponding to 8, 9, and 10 mil drills-ish. Um, and let's look at the impedance through the via structure with about the smallest anti-pad you can use and about the largest that you can use. And with that, I can now look at the impedance, the terminal impedance of the, uh, or the asymptotic impedance of the system and go, okay, here's the one that gives me about the right range where I can control things. And, and it depends on the dielectric you're using. If you're using FR4 and an ESA bar of about four, you can use smaller drills because the dielectric constant's higher, and so that compensates for the inductance of the via path. But if we're using low decay materials, say an E sub R of three, we sometimes have to step up to a larger via than we would like to have had. And, and then I also throw a little bit of, uh, you know, design for manufacturing, there's some manufacturing parameters in there for annular ring size. SI people are really good at designing things that can't be manufactured and they get schooled by their layout team all the time. And so if you negotiate what the annular ring for the pad is and the annular ring for the minimum anti-pad size with your layout team and with your fabricator, well, we can put that in the tool 
And now you can do, perform the optimization based on those rules rather than something that you came up with in your mind. For, as an example, you start doing a design and you've designed a, uh, a design with a, uh, a 0.2 millimeter drill. And the SI person says, oh, well, it's not going to work for me. I need to step it up to a 0.225 or a 0.25. But duh, we forget to change the annulus on the pad. So the pad's too small. And when we send it over to layout, layout says, well, this can't work. I can't build this. So I, I try to take those. Uh, so I look at the layout problem, <clears throat> the manufacturing problems, and the electromagnetics problems in kind of a more holistic fashion. In terms of the optimization procedure, because there are so many parameters and then you're implementing these different constraints, is this a random search? Is this a guided search type of optimization procedure? It's an expert guided search. And okay. the, you, you, the signal integrity engineer, do this, but, but I'll give you guidelines. Very simply, you start with well, what's the pitch of the connector or the vias that you're going to be designing? I'll, we'll talk about differential vias. You know, what's the what's the signal to signal via pitch and what's the signal to ground pitch? Um, we start there. We build a structure and we basically build a through structure from the top of the board to the bottom of the board. And we actually include the balls that would interface to the component or the connector or the connector pins uh, on either side. And we do a simulation of that. And all I'm looking for is what's the impedance of the structure? Because vias by themselves, if we didn't have planes, are a perfectly good uh, transmission line. It's a perfectly good four-wire transmission line. It has good performance, but it's extraordinarily high impedance. We're talking 120, 130, 140 ohms, usually. And then we have planes in between, and those planes have parasitic capacitance. And so the planes periodically load this uniform transmission line with capacitance. Well, once we pass a, a, a waveform down there with a particular rise time, once we've reached the electrical length or the physical length that is equivalent to the rise time of the edge, we now reach a plateau. That's our impedance. So the first thing we do is literally, I do six, yes, yeah, six simulations. Three different via sizes, 0 0.2, 0 0.225, and 0 uh, 0.25. And then two different antipad sizes. Minimum, which is usually uh, 600 uh, basically a 0.6 millimeter ring around, uh, opening around the pad uh, up to um, maybe 900, uh, 0.9 millimeters. So we give it a range. And so for every via, I see what the impedance is of the small, pa uh, small anti-pad and the large anti-pad. And then I have these, I've got six different simulations that I've run in my environment on one processor with 32 uh, cores, these run in about five to 10 minutes. So the, as soon as I see that I have basically this step, this basically this pulse looks like a pulse function of different terminal impedances from the target. And I look for the ones that are really close to it. That's it. Then I can now take those and optimize that particular anti-pad size for its, uh, to get it closer to the target impedance that I want. We also identify that there's usually two types of layer passings in a printed circuit board. The first is thin trace, uh, thin plane layers, which are grounds surrounding traces. They're usually 0.6 mil, uh, 0.6 mil thick. Then there are thick planes used for, um, uh, for power, power and uh, power in the power uh, powers in the grounds for the power system, they're usually thicker. They're often three mils thick. Well, as you can imagine, the parasitic capacitance is significantly higher for the power plane passings than it is for the signal plane, the the signal ground reference passings. And so the anti pad size is different. So we modify that, and again, 
just simple steps. This is a linear problem. So we literally, if we just have two points for antipad sizes, and we see a high impedance here and a low impedance here, we can look at it and go, I think it's going to be about right here. That's a good antipad size. Then we can go in and run some targeted simulations, just dithering that by, you know, 0.1 millimeter, 0.05 millimeters to get us a, a better balance. And so what we try to do is balance the, uh, the trace return path planes with the power planes to flatten the via impedance. Once we've got that, we've got the drill size and the via impedance uh, vias all taken care of. We're done with respect to the via stack itself. Now what we're left with is the back drill section and the trace escape section. And what we're going to do is we're going to control the anti-pad size on the plane above the trace and the plane below the trace. And we're going to change how the differential pair comes in and Ys over into the vias. We can move that point and that'll help in tuning. We can change the bottom anti-pad and we can actually slide it and offset it to create better, uh, a quicker connection to the plane, uh, plane underneath. Um, and then we can simulate our back drilling. And, um, and, and, and it's really that simple. And we, we start out with something that for well, 56 gigabits per second, literally about an hour and you're, you're good enough and you're done. When you go to 112, well, we just doubled the Nyquist frequency. It takes maybe an hour and a half to get everything done good enough. And then finally, if we're going to 224, you're going to spend some time, but we can still do this. We can literally, if you have enough uh, compute cycles and cores, we can have a near optimal design done in days. And so we can get these things done fast, quickly. You learn from them. And then the next step is, all right, now that I've got my via stack design, I'm getting the, ret in the return loss that I want, the impedance control that I want. Now let's look at the crosstalk. And so we build an array of these. It turns out an array of launches still has the same, each launch has, still has the same impedance as the original one. We don't have to readjust that. All we have to do now is go, okay, where's our routing going to go? And based on that, do we need to put any extra ground vias in to shield crosstalk? And so what we basically do is work with our layout person to get the routing directions that they want, the directionality that they want. Then there's always some space and we figure out how to cleverly put vias there in, in those spaces. So that's, that's sort of the process. Along with this process, we can actually change the array in any linear connector or linear package. In some cases, we can actually change the offsetting, the routing direction, and uh, we can do some things to beneficially uh, and preferentially allow us to say, if we want to route vertically, we, we basically uh, offset launches to provide vertical channels, or maybe we keep them all flat and we route out one direction and another to create horizontal channels. So we try to, I try to encompass all that in the training. So it's sort of a master class in how to go through the whole process in a, um, uh, not so much a heuristic, but a holistic fashion and a logical progression for the things that you have to do in the design. Yeah, that is, uh, Quite a bit, um, but of course, super interesting. Um, one thing that I think someone would ask, and of course I'm curious, um, are these just coaxial, whether they're differential or single-ended coaxial? Um, does it apply to blind and buried? Can you do blind, buried, and staggered? Can you do mix and match? Well, so the, the answer is uh, I'm dealing with, I, I've dealt with the through via problem to start with. And most connectors are what I call linear connectors. That is, all of the balls are in a line. So we start with linear connectors, and often they have either, uh, diff if they're differential connectors, two signals, one or two grounds between the pairs. Um, and so we can build the breakouts and we can build the, uh, the launches based on that. So the idea is to take standard connectors, which are often linear, 
and do that. But we can have offset connectors or offset things. We can have, uh, so there's some connectors where the pins are offset uh, uh, back and forth. Um, there's a separate breakout generator that um, for RF uh, single-ended launches, and that will be a coaxial design, but most of them will be just simply ground, signal, signal, ground via designs, optimal for routing high-density boards. Um, as you become, uh, what we found for differential signals, uh, coaxial surrounding a via with a lot of via, uh, a lot, a lot of grounds, uh, signal vias with grounds, is um, it looks pretty. It's uh, near impossible to route in real boards. Um, it's costly and it often causes other problems like uh, uh, basically enclosed cavities that can actually resonate. And so you start having these uh, resonance points and suck outs that you didn't wanna have. So we try to stay with, away from that as much as possible. We allow some of the energy to dissipate in the board, but we want it, we want to guide it to the areas where there aren't any signals. Um, and so that's what ground, st uh, ground stitch vias are. But we try to do that in a routing aware fashion so that we don't cause more problems than uh, we'd like to. I, I like to keep my layout people uh, liking me instead of hating me. And uh, trust me, they hate a lot of signal integrity engineers. <laughs> you know, you bring up the staggered differential and that there's two big areas where I think that really is important is uh, like VPX connectors. Um, and then also on the bottom side of some packaging, especially targeting the 112 G to 24 G uh, types exactly. of, of channels. Yeah, exactly. So we, we, we work with all of that. The, the tool actually allows me to change the stagger um, not only in the balls um, and We'll, we'll basically pre-configure the ball locations for our particular connectors. Um, and, but for pack and the same thing for packages, one millimeter and 0.8 millimeter packaging. But we also uh, separate the ball locations from the via locations. So uh, basically I can incorporate via in pad or uh, offset vias. And the offset vias can be basically uh, adjacent to or basically co-located uh, co or slightly offset. So they basically create a almost like a figure eight uh, pattern. Or we can actually have breakout traces uh, with, you know, room for solder mask and everything. So I incorporate all that and I can break them out in the north direction or the south direction. I can move the vias north or south from a straight line. And the trace routing can go south or north. And in some cases, the trace routing and the vias can be placed diagonal, diagonally, like you, we often do in packaging breakouts, right? We generally put the via in the dead center in the kind of like a number five dice pattern between the, uh, between the balls. So I, I, I envisioned all of those things and incorporate all those things, and it makes it easy to visualize. It also makes it really easy to compare the differences. You know, there's a cost difference between doing via in pad or an offset via. You know, five to 10% or so to do the via, um, you know, the via fill cap and plate. Um, and you can get really high performance products out of that. But if you can do the same thing with an offset dog bone via breakout, well, maybe that's the way to go. And so, um, you know, so we, we look so and you can very simply just with one parameter change that breakout from a via in pad to an offset via uh, breakout and do two simulations. And you've got the A-B comparison and you can say, does it meet my requirements or not? Uh, there's actually some cases where the offset pattern where we actually do a dog brain breakout works better because it provides a little bit of extra induct inductance to compensate for uh, vias that are very, uh, pads and balls and things that are very close together. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, and then for, for, for RF vias, it's a, you know, we use a co coaxial through drill pattern. I started with through drills 
quite simply because um, they're the cheapest. If you can do is if you can do a design totally with through drills, why wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Why would you go to? I've in generally I've I've done lots of micro via designs. I've designed packages. I've designed eight to eight uh, build up packages, and uh, both staggered uh, or what what we used to call spiral uh, uh, micro vias or stacked micro vias. Well, stacked vias are expensive. Mm -hmm. And those wonderful little, and, and you know, of course, we can design a, a board with uh, micro vias on the top cap layer, on the bottom cap layer, and lots of people do it. The problem with micro vias is if you have to go more than one layer, it starts becoming really expensive, or you transition to drilled vias. And as soon as you do that, well, you have your, yeah, your micro via is small, but you can't place it on top of a drilled via. So you actually physically take up more space on the inner layers of your board at the layer that you transition from the micro via to the through via. So I prefer not to do that. I like to push technology. I like to hope that the technology keeps going to where we, have, we can have smaller and smaller drills with higher aspect ratios and use them to, uh, to do our designs. Because micro V is quite frankly, you're a 20 to 40% cost adder, depending on what you're doing. And in some cases, even more than that. So uh, I, I try to stay with the cheap approaches so that uh, uh, people can actually build these in high volume. Yeah, I think uh, your thinking on this makes total sense. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you was about the workflow. Um, my The way I use you know the kind of simulation for these types of uh, transitions is on the front end, right? You prepare what you envision the transition to look like for your stack up and give that to the layout person. They're going to implement that where it needs to be implemented and then they kind of work around that. So you really use it as a constraint. Is that your thinking here as well? It is, but I'm modifying that constraint a bit. So the first off is, you know, constraint number one is what's the connector that you're using? And so I basically, we basically prepackaged that so that you basically load in the connector type you want and a uh, functional breakout is actually generated starting. It's, it's the starting point. The vias may not be sized correctly. The anti-pads not, may not be quite correct, but then in the process, you have the ability to um, choose Two things you always we always get in the breakout generator. That's a through through via, which is a launch on the top, uh, basically a BGA on the top and a BGA in the bottom launching through the board. That's what we use to adjust the anti pads and the and and the spacings and everything. And then the trace escape, and you can choose what layer you want it to escape on. The tool allows you to create a generic stack up from four layers up to 42 layers with a programmable dielectric. In this case, it's a uniform dielectric, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's a complete um, uh, DeGeorgievic Sarkar model used in ANSYS uh, 3D layout. Um, and it's fully programmable. It includes anisotropic behavior, so we can actually look at the XY plane dielectric difference between the X, Y, and the Z directions, which is important for tuning vias. And since this is a via tool, that had to, there has to be a, uh, the ability to enter that. And so we enter that as a, uh, essentially a percentage correction factor um, that uh, you have to either know, derive, guess, or, but anything's better than having flat dielectric constant in all directions, because we know that's wrong. Um, so we do that, but then we also have the ability to look, if we're looking for crosstalk, we can do a, an array of uh, one row with two columns, so the in-row crosstalk, and then uh, a one row, uh, uh, two rows with uh, one column for row-to-row uh, -row crosstalk, so we can now see what do we have to do there? But I can also build an array of two by two, three by three, four by four, five by five, six by six, seven by seven, eight by eight. Boom, they're all built. 
Now you can play with the offsets and staggerings using, it's all totally parameterized. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to move anything. The parameters move it for you. And what I envision is people that have access to this tool could actually sit there with their layout designer and try different patterns and look at them and visually say, because he'll, they'll sit there and go, no, you can't possibly route through that. You don't have enough space. What if I do this? What if I do that? We'll have pre-built patterns that are optimized for best vertical escape with most chan uh, with the largest available channels uh, that you can have, or the or largest uh, channel spacing, you know, so differential pair spacing going through, and the best horizontal channels. And so you can you can optimize or compromise any way you want. And once you get to that, um, you've got that essentially a visual converse, con, uh, 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 conversation with your layout team. Um, you can sit there with the tool and make some measurements and go, okay, here's, I've got 1.2 millimeters between these vias. Is that going to be enough to put our big fat traces through there? Yes or no. Okay, we're done. So it, it makes that process, uh, I'm trying to force the routing visualization process back to the signal integrity uh, person's hands. You then finish the design, finish it, and, and in 3D layout, we can output DXFs. So we can layer by layer uh, DXF, or you can shoot pictures of, of the, now I no longer, if I have a 36 layer board, it would be stupid for me to um, document every 36 layers. But what we're going to document are the different zones that we have programmable. So the zone at the top of the board near the balls, the zone and the thin trace layers, that's another. And that all of those thin trace layer planes will get the same anti-pads. And then we'll have the same one for the thick plane layers. And then uh, we'll have the trace breakout and we'll just say, okay, the layer above the trace breakout gets this, the layer below the trace breakout gets that. And now the uh, layout department can, you know, build those. We, um, in our design flow at Samtech, we build launches as uh, physical components that overlay on top of the pads. So we build, so the ground, the anti-pads are all encapsulated into a hierarchical object that then gets placed in the schematic as a separate object. So your layer six breakout is a uh, pattern is uh, a physical design object in the, uh, in the lay in the, in the schematic tool, because we're actually thinking forward about which layers are we going to route these things on. And if the layout person wants to change from layer six to layer eight, well, they just have to bring in the other object and back annotate the schematic. The beauty of this is that in many layout tools, if you have hierarchy, if you encapsulate the uh, layout of the launches as a physical component, you only have to change each physical component once to make a change. I want to make a change for performance or the layout team says we need to change from this drill to that drill. You need to re-optimize. Great. When it's done, they update the, uh, the, the physical uh, uh, component, press update, boom, everything in the design is updated. And trust me, when you're dealing with boards that have hundreds, if not thousands of launches in them, this is not only a time saver, saver it is a lifesaver because uh, before we started using this, I developed this methodology with um, uh, one of my layout engineers years ago when I was uh, consulting because I got tired of asking the question when I got the board back, why are all these launches identical except for this one? Well, and the answer was the update process didn't work out, the cut and paste didn't work correctly, um, or I just didn't do the cut and paste, or the layout person didn't do the cut and paste. This makes this a seamless and uh, um, uh, simplified process. And 
uh, if you implement it, it's, it becomes error, uh, error free. With you supervising so many people in the signal integrity group at Samtech, um, I'm sure that there are plenty of people who are varying in the quality of the launches that they design, as well as probably a lot of duplicate work. How do you guys handle that? Does this tool help you handle that? Well, we're just rolling out the tool. So I'll start with, I don't supervise anybody. Okay, um, my mistake. As a, strategic, as a tr strategic technologist, what I'm looking for are mm -hmm. problems that need to be solved. And so I, I look for things that nobody else is looking at. And one of the things was we literally build probably a thousand launches a year. That would not be, I know one, just one of the guys that I work with does at least a hundred a year. Um, you know, for, because we, we do this as a service for our customers. And I started looking at them and pulling my hair out and I have a lot, a lot of hair going, why do we keep doing almost exactly the same launch, but it's different? Why do we keep wasting all of this time? Um, and then I also started thinking about how do we do what ifs? What if I change from a dielectric a three to a 3.5 because it's a lot cheaper? Can I, you know, I'm obviously going to change the launch. How do I make that easy? Well, in the tool, I literally just change the dielectric constant and re-optimize and go through the same process again. And I kind of know where I am. And so I know what it might take. I get a, you start getting a feel for how to do things. The idea uh, behind this was simply to save us time internally. And then the realization that we also want to save our customers time and I don't want engineers at Samtech to be designing every launch for the customers that we have. And we have some customers that, you know, will design eight different layers of transition of launches, maybe multiple types of connectors. So there might be 10, 15, 20. And then in the process, their layout department is saying, oh, well, you can't do this because these are our uh, design rules. Um, and so there's all of this thrash that goes around. And so if, if a customer of ours has the tool and we have the tool and they have the same simulation environment that we do, then we can send them prototypes. They can look at it, review it, review it with their layout engineers. We can teach them how to use it and then eventually uh, reduce that, uh, that loop. That uh, that uh, design iterate loop that we have we all go through over and over again. So that was uh, the other thing that I do is I have a uniform I have uniform naming conventions, and so we'll all be talking the same language now. Um, you know the via drill saw. You know the name for the uh, uh, name for a via drill size is literally via drill saw a signal via drill size. Right, via, via drill size signal, via, uh, drill size signal via, or something like that. I've forgotten the exact names, and they're all documented with documentation that tells you what they do. And so now we're talking about the same things. Um, God, how many signal integrity engineers don't understand about pad annual rings and why they're there? They don't understand that they can't put a trace that the anti-pad annular ring is really the stop point where any trace metal can come to. They don't know that because they're routing it on a, a over top of a power plane or, a, or a, a ground plane and the metal's filled in. They don't see that imaginary ring that guards against delamination when the drill is at its um, extreme in the, uh, um, in, in the uh, manufacturing process. So many signal integrity engineers don't understand that the pad is simply the circular probability of error of the drill via position in the manufacturing process due to drill placement and wander um, in the process. So this tool helps to at least unify some of those things so that we can talk about them and understand why they're they're necessary. Well, this is all 
extremely interesting, and um, I would love to play around with it if I can get access to it. Um, if anyone is interested in learning more, um, where can they find you at Design Con? So what day and what room? And then um, how would they be able to get access to this after Design Con? So I don't recall the room, but the, uh, the, the tutorial is literally the first tutorial on Tuesday, the first tutorial session. It's a two and a half hours, hour session on Tuesday uh, at Design Con. I think it's 9 a.m. and I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to have lots of coffee because I'm not a morning person. Although I'll, have, I'll be jet lagged coming from the East Coast, so it'll actually be later for me. So it won't be so bad. Um, and then um, I will be around the Samtech booth. If I'm not, give your card and information to anybody at the Samtech booth at the front counter, and they will find me. We can set up a, I can set up a tutorial, a short demonstration with you. Um, the idea is uh, will this tool will be available for anybody that uses the ANSYS HFSS environment. Um, if, uh, you're, if you use SAMTEC connectors, then you'll be able to use this on selected SAMTEC connectors and we'll be issuing more and more throughout the year. And, uh, and then otherwise, uh, you'll also be able to use it on one millimeter and uh, uh, maybe uh, if I build it up in time, 0.8 millimeter pitch uh, BGAs, because everybody has to do a, a BGA breakout. Um, and I'll do a couple of different variants of that. We don't get a lot of latitude in those, unfortunately, because there's so many darn balls and vias being punched through. But we have a few tricks we can play. Well, this is great. Thank you so much for being with us today. And um, I hope everybody checks out the show notes. They can learn more about what you're doing and... Um, the information for finding you at Design Con will be in the show notes. So anyone that's interested, make sure to check that out. All right, Zach. Th th thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much again. Uh, to everyone that's out there watching, we have been talking with Scott McMorrow, Strategic Technologist for Signal Integrity Products at SamTech. As I said earlier, make sure to check out the show notes, and you can get more information about Scott's tutorial at Design Con. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button. You'll be able to keep up with all of our podcast episodes and tutorials as they come out. And last but not least, don't stop learning, stay on track, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.